I'm Juliette Wolf Robin, National Executive Director of American Photographic Artists, and this is APA Biz Talk. APA is a not for profit trade association of professional photographers. We have commercial, advertising, editorial, corporate photographers, and our mission is really to help them succeed in business. So, this program is part of that conversation. Today, we're going to be talking about copyright registration. We are hosting a series of these. We'll be able to do a deeper dive on particular subjects like this, um, but this one is a, an overview. So today we're very fortunate to have two people who are some of the most knowledgeable in the country on this subject. And there is going to be a Q&A. Uh, there's a Q&A button. So during this, you can certainly ask questions, but we also had you send in questions in advance. And with all those questions, I think that we will probably cover most of what anybody has. If you have additional questions you'd like to discuss later, you can certainly reach us. I'm at executive director at apanational.com. Uh, also, if you come to our website, which is apanational.org and sign up for our newsletters, you'll be informed about when we have more of these webinars. So we have our speakers today, uh, I'm going to give you their full bio because I feel like it's really important to know that the, this information is coming from people who are really knowledgeable on this. So Stephen Doniger is a partner at Doniger Burroughs. It's a firm in Los Angeles and New York that focuses on business disputes in general and intellectual property in particular, representing photographers, authors, fine artists, and clients in marketing, fashion, entertainment, real estate, and the hospitality industries. He's known for his exceptional record of success in copyright and trademark litigation. Stephen Doniger has earned a spot on the Southern California Super Lawyers, an honor bestowed on only 5% of lawyers in Southern California, and he's been selected as the exclusive copyright law expert and recommended attorney for California by global law experts. He serves as counsel for APA, and he's been featured speaker and a contributing author for a wide range of groups and publications. Jeff Sedlick, many of you will know because he's past president of APA. He's been a professional advertising photographer for 35 years and serves as president of the nonprofit group Plus Coalition. Uh, he is a founding director of American Society of Collective Rights Licensing. He's a professor at Art Center College of Design. He teaches courses on copyright law and licensing for more than 25 years. He also serves on both the Creators Advisory Board and Academic Advisory Board for the Copyright Alliance. Sedlick frequently said, testifies as an expert witness in copyright litigation and is a consultant on digital asset management, copyright <clears throat> management information, and intellectual property issues related, related to the visual arts. So these are people who know their stuff and we're really lucky to have them today and participate with us. So thank you to both Stephen Doniger and Jeff Sedlick for being here today, both of you with your antlers in the background. <laughs> and uh, we're ready to get started. <laughs> so um, our first question I'm going to ask both of you because I think it's a, the overreaching, overarching question that we have, not reaching, overarching. Um, why does registering images with the Copyright Office even matter? So Stephen Doniger, could you begin with that question first, please? Sure, happy to. And that's kind of the, uh, the, the, the big picture topic that we're going to be discussing here today and uh, with various cuts at it uh, with all the questions we're going to be, we're going to be discussing. But it, in a sense, you can sort of think of the Library of Congress as as a giant library for our country. And, and the, the goal of library, li library of Congress is to have all of the creative works of the country assembled in one place. And so what sort of the deal they've made is that if you, if you submit your work to the Library of Congress, if you register it, you get certain additional protections um, and remedies. Um, if you register your work within five years of when you first publish it, you're going to get all sorts of presumptions that you have a valid copyright, that you own it, that uh, all sorts of things that, especially as time goes by, may, you know, the evidence may disappear, may be harder to prove. It's really nice to have a presumption because you've registered within five years. Um, but even if you haven't registered within five years of first publication, you still, uh, for any infringements that happen after that registration, you're gonna get 
statutory dam you know, the ability to seek statutory damages, the ability to recover attorney's fees, um, and a whole host of other benefits that you know, we'll talk about in more detail today. Thank you. Jeff? Uh, to be able to effectively enforce your, your rights, you know, you, when your shutter closes on every image, if you're not working as an employee, you own the copyright in that image, provided that you haven't signed it away or that you don't sign it away. Owning those rights, in many cases, is not sufficient for you to be able to enforce your rights and to earn revenue from your rights to run a sustainable business. And your copyright registration is a huge benefit in enabling, enabling you to enforce your rights. At the top of that list, from me, from, you know, from a photographer's perspective, is if I get into an infringement situation and my initial discussions with the infringer fail, I, I want to be able to attract an attorney to work with me. And I, don't, I, I may or may not, depending on which photographer it is, have sufficient funds available to, to bankroll litigation, which can be, you know, uh, attorneys can cost hundreds of dollars an hour and litigation can cost, you know, 50,000, 250,000 or more by the time you're all through with it in, in photography copyright litigation. Having a registration makes your infringement more attractive to attorneys who, are, who have to make a business decision as to whether to accept or, or to engage with you on a contingency basis, where they are essentially making a determination at the outset that they feel that you have a case that is a winning case um, and that you have a case that will enable them to earn their revenue and run their business sustainably. And that's at the top of the list for me as a photographer as to the purpose of registration or so the benefit. The benefit of registration, not the purpose. When should they be registering? Well, actually, before that, can I just add something to what Jeff said? Um, it, actually, two quick things, and then we'll, we'll get back into the questions. The first is really just to give a, an example of what Jeff was talking about. The last case that, that I took to trial was against H&M. We ended up getting a, a, a verdict of uh, between two and $300,000. But we were then able, because our clients had a timely copyright registration, we were able to then submit a, a request for attorney's fees. And we actually got an award of over half a million dollars in fees. So if some, what that means is that if someone was paying us hourly, the cost to litigate that case through trial would have been more than half a million dollars. You're not going to find a, a, an attorney, a competent attorney, that's going to take a case for that much work if you know, even if your upside is, is $200,000 potentially. So it's that ability to recover attorney's fees that comes with the registration that really is gonna make a huge difference in your ability to enforce. And we'll, again, we'll discuss that more later, but I, I thought that a, a, a tangible example based on my last jury trial to sort of, you know, add to Jeff's point made, made a lot of sense. And then the only other thing I really wanna, wanna make clear, because this is, this is often a source of confusion for, for, um, for lay people, is the difference between copyright and registration. And when we talk about registration, I think it's really important to start out with this distinction. People will ask, oh, is your work copyrighted? What they mean is, is your work registered? The moment a photographer takes a photograph or you know, a, a musician records a, a song or a fine artist puts pen to paper, the moment that work is created, the artist has a copyright in that work. Copyright meaning simply the right to copy, the right to make copies of your work. The registration doesn't give you that. The registration doesn't give you any copyrights. The registration gives you certain remedies on that copyright. And so if there's one thing that I wanna kind of get out there at the beginning of this to have people just really change their languaging, if you're gonna ask someone, if, if you're wondering if a work has been registered with the Copyright Office, the question is, is it registered? Not, is it copyrighted? Because is it copyrighted doesn't actually mean anything. And I, in this bigger discussion about registration, I really want everyone to get that distinction between a copyright that you don't have to do anything other than create the work to have and a registration that you need to take steps to make sure you secure in order to get these additional benefits. Good, thank you, I appreciate that. That was great. I mean, even, even in my experience, uh, many attorneys copyright scholars and judges don't make the distinction when they're speaking about it. They know what they're saying. 
but they say is, is it an image was copyrighted or not copyrighted and it just perpetuates the confusion so that's yeah. really so jeff when should somebody register their copyright well the ideal would be to register it before you ever show it to anybody so that's that's the goal right but photographers most photographers can't afford to register their works immediately after they shoot them. That is the correct practice and that's the best practice. The reason is that your work might get infringed while it is unpublished. So you, if you were to show it to a client or a person who then takes it and infringes and it gets infringed when it's unpublished, you can run into a situation, a bad situation, because there's a loophole in copyright law. You know, when we register our works, we get three months from the date of first publication to register them. It's kind of like a, a cushion that Congress gave us. We, we can register that our works at any time throughout the copyright life of the image. But during those first few months, Congress recognized that it's, it's challenging for creators to get their works registered immediately, given the fast pace of, you know, production, even back in the 70s when this the Copyright Act was put together. So they gave us a, through this three month period during which um, you can get your special remedies for infringement, whether or not your, uh, what they call the effective date of registration or the date that you register is before or after the date that infringement started. And for that reason, photographers who assume that they don't have to register um, until, you know, that they can register any time within three months or that they, they save up their images and register every three months, have found that they get into trouble when their work is registered while it is unpublished. So you should develop a, a, a registration scheme that allows you to register as often as you can afford. And that's really what it comes down to. If you can't afford to register before you show your work to anyone, then register regularly and try and register once a month. You know, it's a fantastic investment. <laughs> even if you can only register your most kind of infringible images or images most likely to be infringed, it's better than not registering them or registering them later. So when to register, I would say before you show them to anybody, if you can't afford that, um, register it either once a month or once every two months. Um, there's a lot of confusion about, uh, people often say, well, I can register within 90 days. Well, there's no 90 days in the Copyright Act. It says three months. And some photographers have gotten burned because three months can be 89 days or it can be 92 days, which are bonus days. It's every three calendar months. And Stephen, does anybody ever contact you and then go back to like they've been infringed and then register at that moment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we work with a number of, uh, of, of well-established photography syndication agencies and companies and sometimes they'll find images um, on a site they'll then go back and find a lot more images on the site uh, of theirs turns out a lot of those other images are not registered and then they might go ahead and register some of them um, so that we can add those to the claim that we're going to pursue um, there we've also had instances where we've represented photographers whose work has been used on merchandise um well let's let's go back for just a moment um what i what i want people out there to understand is that if you have a timely registration if you have a registration that predates the infringement you as the copyright holder get to choose whether you want to go after actual damages which can be the profits that someone made selling your work or your lost licensing fee or you can choose statutory damages, which can be up to $150,000 per work per infringement, depending on willfulness and, and a host of other factors. If you don't have timely registration, if you don't have a registration that predates the infringement with the exception of this three month safe harbor provision that Jeff talked about, then you can only seek actual damages. And whether that makes sense to pursue is gonna depend on um, whether you can make a strong enough claim for actual damages. If you've got 500 photographs that, you know, you can show a licensing fee of, you know, of $2,000, $3,000, $5,000 per photograph, then you may have a strong claim for actual damages that justifies pursuing litigation. 
if you have a photograph that's been used on merchandise, um, you know, we had a case where a client of ours had these uh, images of Biggie and Tupac that were used on a, a, a ton, I mean, seven figures of merchandise. Um, you know, there was an actual damage claim there that justified pursuing the case. But in a lot of cases, someone comes to us with a claim and they say, we've got a claim and, and it, it, we don't have registration and it's one image, maybe two or three images. Um, and they can't really show a licensing history or we can't really justify a very significant fee. You're not gonna, most responsible attorneys are not going to initiate litigation over an unregistered image that has a licensing value of, you know, charitably $2,000, um, you know, and, and maybe less. And there's been significant backlash in some of the courts, and I don't want to get off topic, but about people doing that, uh, about clogging the court system with effectively small claims cases, which is why there's a big push to create a copyright small claims court uh, to more efficiently address these. Um, so the basic answer is yes, you can wait until someone infringes to register, but it may not make sense to pursue the case financially. Uh, you may have trouble finding an attorney to pursue the case financially. And, you know, Jeff mentioned earlier, if you can't afford, you know, registration, register when you can. But if your work is going to be infringed, you can't afford not to register. Um, and putting the money out for that registration early, you know, before the infringements are going to start happening, will pay for its, its self in spades. Do you think somebody should go back and register all their, if they've never registered before, should they start registering now images from, from the past? Yeah, so I mean, Jeff can certainly speak to this as a professional photographer, you know, better than I can, but I know from speaking to a lot of my clients, they have huge quantities of, of, of pictures they've taken, and a lot of them have never seen the light of day. And I wouldn't, you know, if ideally I would, we'd want to see everything, you know, everything registered, but if images have never seen the light of day, they're not going to be infringed. So really, I think you can focus on the ones that have been put out there. Um, and that doesn't just mean the ones that have actually been published, the ones that have done your social media, but even the ones that you've sent to clients to, to consider using if, uh, if they then, you know, you send them, 50 images, then they're going to choose 12 of those for their campaign. And, but all 50 of those images are now sort of circulating around. So, you know, you want to prioritize and, and the most important thing is to be realistic about which ones could conceivably be infringed. And, and in an ideal world, you get all those covered. And, and Jeff, is there, what is the limit of images that can be registered at one time or is there a limit? Well, before February of 2018, you could register basically an unlimited quantity of unpublished images on a single registration. I know photographers who registered close to 100,000 images on one registration. Um, and what's going on there is that the Copyright Office, at a certain point, begins to subsidize our registrations because they have certain costs. Somebody has to open every, open all the images, look at the images. Um, process all the information that's in the registration and there's a cost to that and there's other costs at the Copyright Office in processing that registration and they are funded by the Library of Congress which is in turn funded by the federal government and they only have a certain amount of money to operate on and they can't continuously subsidize our registrations which they have been doing. At the same time they didn't want to jack the price up to hundreds of dollars per registration so what they decided to do and what has caused a lot of uh, uh, concern by photog you know, among photographers is they limited the registrations to $750, 750 images per registration, which as you know, in a photo shoot, we might shoot 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 frames in a day. And over the course of a week, 10,000 frames or more. And it used to be a simple matter of just you know, putting those on a registration and submitting them and it no longer is. So you actually have to pick 750 at a time and register them. And that uh, began in February of um, uh, 2018, 2018. I had a couple um, just things to add to Stephen's um, answer. I made a couple notes, um, you know, just for, for, just for photographers. Um, so, you know, when, when you have the, the availability of actual damages and statutory damages because you have submitted that timely registration 
before an infringement started or within three months of uh, first publication, you get to wait, I think in most, if not all courts, and Stephen will correct me on this, until the end of the, of the whole procedure, the trial procedure, and then the jury comes back or the court comes back and says, well, here's your actual damages and here's your statutory damages, which do you want? And one's going to be higher than the other almost always, and, and you get to pick. And um, not all photographers and not all attorneys understand that, uh, but it can be a significant difference between those two numbers. You know, we like we as photographers like to say, go, go, go to an infringer and say, well, you're going to owe me $150,000 in statutory damages. Well, that's uncommon for judges or juries to award the full 150 unless there's kind of egregious willful infringement. You might get 30000 and uh, if it's not willful, you might get $750. And if they find that it's innocent infringement, you might get $200 per image. So um, the, the other thing is that even if you don't timely register, you get to force them to stop their infringing activity. That's called injunctive relief. So you get to go to the court and say, this is harming me and this is how it's harming me and you need to stop it and the court will stop it. Of course, you have to file a registration before you can even go to court. But that untimely registration is your ticket to being able to stop an infringement when the infringer just won't stop. And then lastly, uh, Stephen mentioned something great, which was your licensing history as a photographer has a great deal to do with not only what actual damages are gonna be available to you, but whether or not you can convince an attorney to take your case. If you have a history of licensing unlimited rights or signing work for hire agreements, or uh, licensing a lot of royalty-free and microstock for very low dollars for unlimited usage, that counts against you in court when, it, when the other, the other side is going to find all that information. You're going to have to expose it to them and they are going to show not only your revenue stream but all of your licenses and there's really you can't hide that stuff and it can come back to haunt you. So you have to be very particular when you're licensing just as Stephen said. And Stephen, can somebody else license, uh, register the images for you? Could you go to a service and say, here, do this for me? Or does the photographer have to do that themselves? No, um, there are uh, other services that can assist you in registering. Uh, some of the syndication companies handle registrations for some of their clients. Uh, there's other you know, search companies uh, I, I know out there that help register for their clients. Uh, some attorneys help register for their clients, um, but my strong recommendation uh, as an attorney uh, is that photographers know how to do this and, and do it themselves. It's kind of the teach a man to fish thing. Uh, you know, the last thing that I want is for one of my clients to run into a situation where for some reason they can't get in touch with the person who usually registers their work and they don't know how to do it. And, and one really, it's, it's once you figure it out, once you know what you're doing and it becomes sort of part of your, your regular process, there's no one better to register everything than the photographers. And it just takes out a lot of extra work of having to transfer all the files to someone else and make sure it was done right and get them all the information. Cause the, the application form is really a pretty simple form. It's a two page answer, a few questions, um, and then upload, you know, the, the spreadsheet or the images or, you know, it, it, it's, there are complications in it that have driven some of my clients a little crazy. But once you get past those complications, it's not a complicated procedure. And, and Jeff, how much is it to register 750 images? It's $55. Okay. And can it be, could you do a, a proof sheet that had like each proof sheet had 30 images on it and then have 30, 750 times 30? Could you do that? Or does each one have to be an individual image? We, we used to do that. That was the way my studio did it. We made proof sheets and submitted the proof sheets and you submit 10,000 images or what have you. Copyright Office doesn't want that anymore. They want you to actually submit the images. And so you make, uh, you make JPEG files that are ready to submit. They don't have to be huge files. Um, you, you, make, you prepare JPEG files and you just upload them. You can put them in a zip folder um, and upload them to the system. Uh, the system used to have problem accepting larger files. It's really not a problem anymore. But your your actual files that you submit, if, um, you know, some photographers submit tiny files like 300 pixels across. You might as well submit a, like a 2,000 pixel across image, and you can 
compress it at, let's say, um, 80% or, or, or thereabouts. The, the reason is those images are going to be used by your attorney later in court, put up on a screen in front of the jury. And if there's subtle differences, let's say if there's an infringement matter where there's two very similar or substantially similar images, it's nice to have sufficient resolution in that JPEG that you filed for the jury to be able to see the difference. So about 2,000 pixels, and you can upload as many as you want. There's no need to make proof sheets anymore. And that is also going to be beneficial down the road when the Copyright Office later makes certain searching of their records, maybe by image recognition possible, because searching proof sheets by image recognition is problematic. And, and if I was photographing a private event and I didn't think these were going to be published anywhere, is there any reason that those need to be registered? Like if it's a celebrity event and, and do I have to risk also if I do register them that they'd be seen by somebody who shouldn't see them? Because nothing's ever leaked. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I mean, it ends up um, somebody's going to post that online and then it's going to be downloaded from social media and then moved elsewhere. And then it's going to end up in some kind of in the New York Post or, 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 or in some ad or on some commercial site. And so especially when it comes to celebrity images, it's very good practice to spend the $55 and register. And really, you know, what it's come down to is there's two types of clients. There's those clients who pay you before they use it and there's those clients who pay you after they use it. And those are the infringers, right? And so we have two revenue streams and we have to accept that as photographers. Every one of your photographs is gonna get infringed if it's online, uh, unless it's an absolutely horrible photograph. So because all <laughs> your photographs are so great, they're all gonna get infringed and you need to prepare for oh, that. Jeff, now, now you're just gonna make people feel bad if their work doesn't get infringed. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to ask some practical questions to Jeff about registering, and then we're going to come back to Stephen to talk about more about protecting the work uh, to keep it from getting infringed and what, hap what happens if you do get infringed. So uh, on practical matter, um, can you explain, Jeff, a little bit about bulk registration of images? Is that the 750? Is that considered the bulk registration, or is there something else that's bulk registration? That is, that is. And I, you know, I would also caution that there are some services who are offering, you know, registration of your work that you need to really look into um, because they may or may not know what they're doing. Some services do and some services don't. And there's a whole cottage industry of companies that offer to register your work for you and not all of them know how to register photographs. There's specific procedures for photographs only. And do you have to put the Actually, date the photo was taken? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Stephen. I, I just want to add to that, that I was retained once as an expert witness on the standard of care and handling copyright matters. And it was a malpractice case where the former attorney was being sued for incorrectly registering the, the works. And in the underlying case, the case got thrown out because the registration was not done correctly. And then they turned around and sued the attorney for malpractice. That's so it's not just services, yeah. And and I and then I ended up being you know retained by the the, um, the defense firm was a firm that we had uh, had just gone to trial against and basically whooped, and so then they turned around and hired us as uh, as as their hired me as their expert on the standard of care. So, you know, and I'm not saying this to to toot my own horn. I'm saying you know you can go you can be like oh I got advice from an attorney. Just like Jeff was saying, not just third-party services, but even you know, attorneys make sure that this is really what they do and they know what they're doing. Or the best thing you can do is, as, as professionals, is familiarize yourself with the, the Copyright Office registration guidelines and practices and just know what you're doing and do it. Thank you. Sorry. Well, we're we're going to go over some of those specifics. So does the date have to be the date the photo was taken or are you putting in the date just when you're registering your images? Yeah. Um, when, when you register, if you're registering a group of images, it's going to say uh, date of completion. And that would be the date on which you took the most recently. Well, I, think, I think it's just a year, it's just a year of completion. Date of first publication, year of completion. Okay. I think you're right. So, and yeah. so that would be the year in which well, for unpublished though, I'm talking about unpublished. Um, then, but it, it's still just a year of completion. Okay, so the year in which you complete, that you, you shot the most recent photograph. You know, an unpublished registration, you can go in there and register photographs from any number of projects, from any number of years. Um, you can put them all on the same registration as long as you don't exceed 750. And what they're asking you for there is the most recent year in which you took the, one of the photographs that's, that's included in the group. 
when it comes to publication, now they're actually asking you for the month and year uh, of, of publication, not the actual full date. And you have to fill in a spreadsheet. Um, and there are instructions for that. There's great instructions on the Copyright Office website. There's an FAQ, there's a video, and photographers tend not to go look for that. But if you just go to copyright.gov, click on register a copyright, and then scroll down, there's a picture of a photographer, click on it, and there's videos that are great that answer a, a lot of the questions that you might have. Uh, there's FAQs, there's PowerPoints, and the Copyright Office really went out of their way because of pressure from the Photography Association to provide uh, information to us. And if somebody creates a derivative work of their own work, do they need to re-register the new images separately from the original images that they created? So let's say that you um, take a picture of a model on a seamless and you register it, and then you want to put that model on a different background. Maybe it's, you know, the forest, okay? And, and so now you've already registered the image of the model on the seamless. Copyright Office strongly discourages registering an image twice. And so what you want to do, if you want to register that derivative work, you go ahead and register it, but there's a page on the copyright registration that's called limitation of claim. And in that page, you enter your previous registration number and you describe what you're excluding from that registration, which is the picture, just the model or herself. And now you've registered your derivative work without re-registering this image that's already registered. Importantly, you wanna maintain that original registration date of that first registration, which might've been years ago. So be very careful to use that limitation of claim page on the registration form. That is an instance where you're gonna to wanna to use the standard form rather than the group form, because the standard, the, the group form doesn't allow you to limit your claim. And, can and you if I can add to that, I, I don't wanna to get too far in the weeds on this, but if all you're doing is taking some other generic sort of background and putting the model against, you know, a, a, a wallpaper backdrop of, of a jungle or something like that, if you don't own that wallpaper backdrop of a jungle, there's no reason that you would register the derivative work. Because you can't, when you register derivative work, that, that new registration only covers the new art, whatever new copyrightable expression is in the derivative work, not the original work that was previously registered, I think is, is what sort of Jeff was getting at. And so if you don't own that wallpaper, that wallpaper backdrop, if it's something that you got from like, you know, freewallpaper.com or whatever, you really want to look at what is it that you're registering. And if it's already covered by another registration, or if it's something you don't own, there's no reason that you would register the derivative work. Unless, unless the other work was also yours and you're using kind of selection, coordination and arrangement, putting them together, then you might want to consider that if that's really the work that you're going to put out there and if the whole derivative was going to be infringed. Can I register the same image both has unpublished originally and then when I find out it's published, do I re-register it as published? I'm going to take a stab at that, but I, I, you know, I want Stephen to chime in as well. I'm not an attorney. So you do not need to re-register, and there really is no reason to re-register your work. If you've registered it as unpublished, you do not need to re-register it when it's published. If you want, let's say you come out with a book and you've registered all of your works when they were unpublished, and now you've come out with a book, and um, that book is a book of all your photographs. You wanna be very careful there, because when you register a book, you're registering what's called a collective work, which is the book. It's a type of compilation. Those two terms are defined in the copyright statute. And there are some rules or, or some limitations on your available damages or statutory damages when you register a collective work. You can only get one statutory award if somebody infringes all the photographs in the book if you registered that work as a collective work. There are exceptions and there's difference in uh, treatment of that in different circuits, but in general, you have to be very careful. And so what you would do is register them all as unpublished, and then you register the book, you can go ahead and register it as a book, and then you use that limitation of claim to exclude the photographs and just to register the design, the text, and any graphics that are in the book. But um, I'll, saying that, I want, you know, Stephen to jump in and correct me if I got something wrong there. No, I mean, I, I think the, the short answer to the question is once something's registered, it's registered and you don't need to re-register it. Um, and, that, and what if it. I don't quite, know? Quite frankly, and quite frankly, whenever an infringement takes place, because you want to make sure that you've got a timely registration, you're always going to go back to your first registration anyway. 
And if I don't know when it was published, but now I want to, I know it was published, but I don't know what month exactly. Can I just give the best guess? Yeah, absolutely. You, you just uh, put your best estimate on there uh, on, based on the records you have. If at some point later on, it turns out that that was inaccurate, uh, there's a fairly simple procedure called a forum CA that you can apply to your registration to correct it and put the correct information forward if you need to. And Jeff, somebody asked, can the file name ever change? Yeah, I mean, uh, so the Copyright Office, when you, when you send in your registration, it's going to ask you for the name of the photograph or the title of the photograph, the title of the group of the photographs, and then they're also going to ask you for the file name because they have to manage the files that you upload. So the file name that you use in this spreadsheet that, that you download from them or that you create yourself needs to match the image that you upload, but you're free to use any file name in the future. And just as well, you're free to use any title for the work. In other words, if you wanted to be kind of sloppy and just title your works photo one, photo two, photo three, and in your next registration do the same thing, you can do that um, and they will approve it. But the, the thing is you should be very organized in your registration practice so that when, you're when your images are infringed in 15 years and you need to go back to your hopefully hundreds of registrations, you can immediately find the work without having to sort through a bunch of stuff. So for yourself, come up with a way to title your photographs when you submit them, come up with file names that you use that are particular, and then also carefully um, choose the group title. And um, in saying that, be careful when you're registering photographs not to mention any type of collective work in the title of your registration, just to be extremely cautious. So don't say the word book or website or brochure um, in the title of your registration of a group of photographs. If you've done that in the past, it's in the past. It's not something you have to correct. But there are judges who have looked at those titles and said, well, you registered a collective work. They've done that incorrectly but sometimes those things stand. And so it's safest to leave any reference like calendar or menu or whatever out of the title of your group of photographs. So I'm gonna ask Stephen some questions about protecting the work to begin with. Um, should a website, if I'm posting images, my images on my website, should I put any specific wording on my website <laughs> to better protect the images should somebody take it? Yeah, so that's a great question. And the answer depends on whether you want those works to be published or unpublished. Um, people think, and this seems counterintuitive to me personally, uh, and Jeff and I have kind of gotten into this a bit in the past, but once something's been put out there for the public to see, there are a lot of people who think, oh, well, it's published, it's been made public, it's on my website, anyone can go see it. Um, that's not necessarily true. In fact, it's not true. The Copyright Office says that if you post something on social media, on your, uh, your Instagram or your Facebook page, it's not published. Um, that's not, that doesn't count as publication. There needs to be an off, uh, the right and ability of others to further distribute it beyond that. Um, so there's been some cases arguing whether or not if it's on a public Instagram page because they've got, you know, it's well known, you can link and embed to public pages that whether that's publication and it's, you know, and it's still not. <laughs> um, but really the question is like, what do you want? Uh, what do you want people to be able to do with your images? Uh, if I post it, let's say I'm a photographer and I've got a website and I use that website to generate sales. And I have language on that website that says, you know, any images on here are available for reprint at, you know, X price, please contact me, reach out. Putting it on the website would now, that would be presumptively a publication because you're putting it out there with the intention of further displaying and offering it for sale. And, and, um, and so if you want it to be published, you want that sort of language on, on a website. Conversely, there are a lot of people who put things on their websites and saying, you know, these images are all copyright protected, do not, you know, not to be used to reproduce without express permission. And, you know, it, that cements the fact that that it would not be a, a publication. Um, so it, there's more of a business decision there than a legal decision, but I certainly would, uh, would encourage anyone using platforms like um, 
well, really any social media platforms to put something on their, their pages expressly stating that it is not authorized for further distribution if, if it's not. Um, because there are still people making arguments that, well, because this was on Instagram on a public page, I thought I had a right to use it based on Instagram's terms and conditions. Those arguments haven't held up in court. In fact, our firm has been at the forefront of like of defeating those arguments in court. But anyone who's ever looked at uh, terms of service of uh, companies like Facebook and Instagram know that um, they can be read to say different things. And and so ultimately, what you want is uh, again, assuming you've got timely registration, you want to be able to establish that the taking of the image was not an innocent mistake, but was willful infringement because that's gonna get you much higher statutory damage awards. And so having language on your on your websites that makes clear that there is, you're not, by putting it on the website, you're not giving anyone the right to further reproduce those images uh, without express permission can be very helpful. And should photographers either watermark their images or put a copyright notice on their image? Yeah, that's another really great question. So far, pretty much everything we've been talking about here today is under a Section 504. Like, there's two different there's two different types of infringement of copyright. Most of the time, what we talk about is sort of your garden variety violation of the right to copy, the right to reproduce, the right to display. There's a whole separate part of the Copyright Act dealing with copyright management information. Um, watermarks, gutter credits, uh, things that indicate who the copyright owner is. And if you put those things onto your images, the watermarks are, are a, great, a great example, or I've seen people have a di digital signature at the bottom of their photos. If you put those things in and someone infringes your photo and then crops that information out, it's a completely separate claim that does not require timely registration and can give you statutory damages of between 2,500 and 25,000 per work plus attorney's fees. So, you know, and then I, back years back, there's a whole talk about Orphan Works uh, Act, which would, would basically mean that if you find a photo online and you can't tell who owns it, then it might reduce damages. It, nothing ever came of that because it was quite frankly a bad idea, but it also takes away the arguments of, oh, I found this image online. I, I couldn't figure out who owned it. And I thought that, you know, um, you know, Absolutely. I highly recommend putting some kind of a gutter credit, I'm sorry, some kind of a, a watermark or a digital signature um, in the image. When it's being distributed, you might also want to make sure, I know most photographers, or at least a lot of photographers have their camera sets so that there's metadata automatically in the photos as they get digitally distributed. Um, those are all important things for the secondary copyright management information removal claim that, you know, that can add significant value to an infringement claim and just let people find you as the photographer. Um, I, I would add to that that um, many photographers find that these claims for removal of their copyright management information are more lucrative than their infringement claims. Um, you know, one thing, uh, one clarification, uh, Steve, you were talking really fast. I think you meant to say it's 2,500 to 25,000 per violation, whereas right. infringements are per yeah. work, right? right? So if you have, yeah. You know, if you find that somebody stripped out stripped out your uh, watermark or your copyright management information, and then they put it on the web a thousand times, it's a thousand times twenty five hundred to twenty five thousand. It's a big, big number. Even if you didn't register before that happened, and so um, very important. Now, copyright management information very quickly is anything that identifies you, um, identifies the rights, or identifies the work. It's not just your copyright notice, it's your name, your address, uh, your copyright notice, and other information, the title of the work. If they strip that, um, first of all, it's legal to take it out. It's legal for them to strip all your metadata out, um, but it's not legal to do it if they do it to induce, enable, facilitate, or conceal um, infringement. And that's, that's where they cross the line and where these damages kick in. So does it matter if it's just a copyright symbol and your name? Does it have to have a year? Does it, is there a format that people should really be following? Or as long as they have something, that's better than nothing? I mean, there are international treaties um, that say basically that there, there, there should be three parts, the copyright symbol, your name, and the year in which it was first published. And you can't update that year every year just to make it look like you shot that photograph yesterday. Um, it has to be the year in which it was first published. And the omission of the year has been found to be 
um, not, and uh, it's, been, it's been found to be what's called a de minimis error, but um, to be safe, those three elements should be there. It can also be the word copyright or a certain abbreviation of copyright that it's like C-O-P-Y-R, I, I, I forget exactly what it is, but three elements, your name, which can be your last name, your business name, if your business owns it, the year in which it was first published, and the copyright symbol or the word copyright. Okay. So let's say um, somebody's putting their work on social media uh, and it's, it can, should they be putting it actually on their image, on each image, or if they just have some notice on their social media, on the top heading of their social media page, is that enough? Or each time they post an image, should they be adding something? It'd be ideal to have it on each image. Um, okay. People can post images to their social media page they don't own, and while a general statement on their website is going to be helpful, it doesn't necessarily mean it applies to each and every image. And when you take, when you show an image and you're making a claim, especially if you're making a claim for removal of copyright management information, it's really helpful to be able to show you know, the, the original image with the copyright management information and then the infringed image where it's been cropped out uh, makes for the, the more compelling case. And plus, if that image does get circulated around uh, with the copyright management information in place, it, it does a service to the photographer by letting people know that it's their image. And does it matter if it's your name has a photographer or your company name? Does it matter who actually, does it have to be the name of the way it was registered or just your name? Well, it's copyright management information, not photographer identification information. So the general understanding, and, and Jeff, let me know if you've got a, a different take on this, is that as long as it allows the person looking at the photograph through some research or some way to, to link back to how they can license the photo and get in touch with the people that, that are, are managing the, the copyright in the photo, that's sufficient. I agree. And the place to be really careful about either using your name as an individual or your, the name of your corporation is if you do have a corporation and the, your articles of incorporation say that you're an employee and, and then there's not, no other agreement between you and your corporation as to who owns the photographs. Your corporation is going to own those photographs. It's work made, works made for hire. And when you're registering those photographs, and this is where photographers blow it, you need to put the right entity, either you as an individual or your company name, your corporation name, on that registration. If you're a sole proprietor, that's the equivalent of an individual. So if I, if I was going to put Jeffrey Sedlick or Jeff Sedlick Photography, it probably wouldn't make a difference because I don't have a corporation. If I had a corporation and I didn't have an agreement with my corporation that I owned the photographs as an individual, then I would be putting my corporation name on all those registrations. That can be a fatal error in your registration that'll get your registration tossed out and your case tossed out. I, you, you want to do it right. Um, I, Jeff, I don't, we don't want to overstate that one. I mean, the Ninth Circuit said in the Jules Jordan case where Jules Jordan had a company that owned the stuff and he sued in his own name, or maybe it was vice versa. They actually said that a third party is it lacks standing to even make that challenge where there's no dispute between, you know, the, the two entities. Um, at least here in the Ninth Circuit, like that's been found to not be terminal, but that certainly shouldn't undermine the point of, uh, of trying to just make sure everything's done right in the first place. I agree. I mean, I think in the Second Circuit, it's the opposite, and it's just best practice to make sure you put the right name of who yeah, actually absolutely. owns the on your registration and not have your attorney um, have to dig a hole, uh, dig out of a hole against a bunch of motions to dismiss your case um, because you put the wrong name on it. Yeah, don't make a stick out of a hole. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Jeff, somebody's been infringed uh, upon, what's the first thing that they should do? I'll tell you the first thing not to do, and that's do not send an invoice ever to an infringer. It's a, it's a big mistake right out of the gate. And if you ask online in various Facebook groups and forums and whatever, you'll get a bunch of responses back and say, send them an invoice, you know, no. You want to first determine how the image was actually used. You could be looking at the tip of the iceberg of infringement. You might have seen them posted on Instagram, but you don't know that they also made t-shirts, calendars, coffee mugs, and that they used it in their trade shows and that they used it in ads. You don't know that. So, and, uh, so um, if you 
feel confident that you can engage with that infringer um, competently, then engage with that infringer. And I would recommend that you do it, if you decide to do that, that you do it um, in a way that is respectful and not an attack and don't treat them as evil people um, unless and until you find out that they're evil people. Most of the times it's the, <laughs> it, 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 these infringements are, you know, somebody, some, some, an employee took an image and there was not correct protocol in place, which is the fault of the company who should have trained that employee and who, who should have had correct digital asset management and rights management policies and enforce them. But nevertheless, what uh, the best practice in my view, if you cannot afford to go to an attorney immediately, is to simply ask uh, uh, politely, um, I see that you've used my image. I don't have a record of, of licensing this usage. Can you check your records and determine whether or not you have a license. If you have a license, please send a copy of it to me. And then if they do respond back and say, you know what, we don't have a license, which oftentimes they will if you take that approach, um, then you can respond back and say, well, um, I need to understand how this image was used before we can talk about settling this matter or resolving this matter. And then you ask a series of questions. When did you get the image? In what media has it been used? questions that you would use to determine what the value of their usage is and engage that way towards settling the matter. Along the way, don't quote any fees, don't, don't mention any dollar amounts, um, and try and avoid threatening to the best extent possible so that if your talks with that infringer fail and you have to go to Stevens firm or another attorney, you haven't already quoted some number that you would accept even though settlement negotiations aren't necessarily acceptable in court, if you send an invoice, um, you are applying a, a dollar amount that could uh, be an exception to that rule and get introduced. And you don't want to be up against your own number. And I, I, I you know, I, I defer to Stephen on that. Yeah, no, that, that that's absolutely correct. I have uh, on a you know at least a weekly basis, if not a near daily basis, I have. Uh, infringers reaching out to me saying, hey, we got this letter, we got this complaint, like what, what's your client looking for? And my response is always, you know, I, I, I'm just making up a number unless I actually know this full scope of use to be able to determine a reasonable, you know, a reasonable settlement. Um, it's going to be partly based on the li licensing fee and partly based on really like a multiple of that um, for you know, where there's timely registration and we can seek statutory damages. There's no guide, clear guideline as to what the right amount of statutory damages are. There are some judges, um, mostly in New York and the Southern District, where there have been a, a flood of these cases. There have been a number of decisions by district court judges there saying, well, we think that a reasonable statutory damage award is going to be anywhere from you know, three to five times whatever the licensing fee would be, depending on the level of willfulness. So Statutory damages are not simply designed to be compensatory to compensate you for the license fee that, that you would have been due. It's also designed, they're also designed to be uh, punitive and deterrent to, to stop, make people think twice before using images they don't have a right to use. And so there's sort of this multiplier uh, effect. If an ad is being used on a, on a, you know, on a billboard across New York City to, to promote something that would normally be a, you know, a $25,000 licensing fee, then that's gonna be your starting point. Um, if it was just being used as a sort of one of, you know, 20 images on a, you know, on a blog post uh, that's tangential to the main, you know, business of, of the company, then that's going to be a very different thing. Um, so I think it's just another way of, of, of saying what, uh, what Jeff was saying. I agree and if an artist takes your photo and does a painting exactly of your photograph, is that considered an infringement? Yeah, so that's a really, really great question because it, it, all, it dances around the question of fair use, which we could do an entire seminar on. Uh, many of you are well aware of, uh, of Lynn Goldsmith's case where Andy Warhol covered her Prince photo and uh, uh, it ended up in litigation and it was found to be fair use and it just went up to the, to the, uh, the circuit court that seemed very skeptical of, of that and uh, I think they may, may end up sending it back. But that was an Andy Warhol version of her photo. It wasn't a verbatim reproduction. If you're basically painting a lifelike reproduction of someone's photo, um, in my view, that is almost always going to be an infringement. 
Uh, other people might say because you're changing the medium and, and maybe you're you're turning it into fine art, you're you know, you're always going to face the fair use arguments, and it's it, it's you know I would need some more information on the hypothetical that you're asking me to to opine on, but it's a really interesting question because of that. But I will absolutely say that just because someone has done a painting of your photograph doesn't mean that it's not an infringement. Sorry for the double negatives there. <laughs> I deal with that um, daily. A lot of my work is copied by painters, illustrators. People make woodcuts. People make murals. And I, I've had some really interesting conversations about respect for each other's work. And, um, you know, what, what Stephen was talking about is transformative use. Transformative use can be changing, um, changing the work visually, or as Stephen said, changing the intent or using it in a different way than perhaps the photographer originally intended. And so I'm pretty careful of, you know, as a photographer, when I take a photograph, I intend for it to be used in all different types of media. I intend to license that work to artists so that they can make copies of the work. Um, that's how I earn my revenue throughout the copyright life of the work. And some of the courts though have said, well, there's no evidence that this photographer was gonna make a book or sell fine art prints. So we're gonna allow these modified images because the intent was transformed. We're gonna allow this as fair use. And there's a lot, there, as Stephen said, that's a, that'll have to be another seminar. So Stephen, um, let's say somebody has been infringed, they're ready to contact an attorney. What ways do you want them to be prepared before they call you? Yeah, so the first question is, and tying right in with our seminar is, is there a registration? And it amazes me how often people contact me and don't actually know the answer to that. Like, oh, I think this might've been registered on this before, but I've got to go back, pull your registration. If it's registered, pull your registration, go back through your records, figure it out. If not, get the information necessary to determine whether or not, uh, or what it's gonna to take to register it. And especially if it's an image that was published fairly recently, where you might still arguably be within the three month safe harbor, jump on that. Because if you're within the three month safe harbor, you can even, that's one of the rare instances where you can register after the infringement and still then have timely registration. So that's, that's the first thing. Um, the next thing, next question is make sure that what you found that you think is an infringement, make sure it's an infringement, make sure that it's not licensed, you know, make sure that if you shot this for a magazine, that magazine didn't, you know, like take a look at your agreement. Did that magazine authorize the third party to republish these images? I, you know, don't, don't waste your time and don't waste an attorney's time. Um, Absolutely make sure to collect all the evidence. Do screen grabs, um, you know, full, full page grabs uh, where we've got the, the date that the article was put up or whatever, you know, wherever it was, get whatever evidence you can locked down. Don't count on your attorneys to do that. And this is really, really, really important. Um, we've had, I've had cases where because my office has done some more digging into a claim, the defense counsel has tried to take the deposition of, of, of an attorney in my office or someone on my staff claiming that they're now a witness because they're the ones who would have to testify as to the authenticity of the screen cap or the grab or the evidence. You don't want your attorney to end up becoming a witness in your case. You should document all the evidence of the claim. And the final thing is just consider fair use. You know, just consider fair use. If, if you shot you know, an amazing photograph of, I mean, it reminds me of a case that there's an attorney in, in, in New York who filed a lawsuit um, against, a, a, for, new, for a news, news reporting of, there's a couple who filmed the live birth of their child and posted it online. And then someone reported that on, on this, that someone had filmed the live birth of their child and posted online, and they put just a small snippet of that video as part of that news reporting, and a lawsuit was brought. And the attorney never should have brought it, and the case got thrown out, and the judge said no reasonable attorney would have brought this. This is clearly fair use. This is clearly, you know, using just a small part of it to report on this thing that happened. So consider fair use. And so I think, you know, just running through the points I made is, is pull your registration and, and jump on it if it's not registered yet and collect the evidence, ensure that it's not licensed and uh, 
consider fair use. And what should they watch out for when choosing an attorney? Is there anything that photographers need to be aware of? I know one, one thing that we've talked about is that photographers could end up paying. They, it's not like they're guaranteed. It's not like they, there's no risk or no cost. And I think that's an important element I'd like to just bring up. Yeah. Um, so let me address that and then I'll, I'll answer your question about what to look out for. Uh, we've talked about how without a timely registration, you can't seek attorney's fees. The thing is the defense can still seek attorney's fees. And that's a lot of things. That's something that people don't realize is, you know, and any attorney that, that is responsible and is really looking out for their client is going to talk to the client and be like, look, you have to realize that you want an attorney to go pursue a case for you to get you paid for the use of your image. And if there's a, even a question that it might be fair use, if there's even a possibility that you might end up losing that case, your upside, especially without a timely registration, your upside is gonna be a reasonable licensing fee. And then let's say that you've got an amazing licensing history and you can justify a $50,000 licensing fee. Okay, great, That's the upside on your case is $50,000. The downside, if you lose, is you could be liable to the defendant for their attorney's fees, and that could be hundreds of thousands of dollars. And there was an attorney fee award against the, the plaintiff in that, that video case I mentioned before. That same attorney who handled that case has handled a number of other cases that have resulted in attorney fee awards against his clients that far exceeded their upside in those cases. So you want to, you know, Everyone wants an attorney who's a cheerleader for them. And, you know, there's no one, there's no one like our firm that takes a stand for artist rights and, and takes more, more, is more passionate about making sure that artists get paid for the use of their work. But by the same token, your attorney should be telling you what the downside risk is. Um, and you want to make sure that that attorney is, has taken cases to trial, has a good reputation. Um, do a Google search. I mean, it's possible, look, anyone can get online and, and write something bad about someone. But if you get online and, and look up an attorney and there's a lot of bad stuff about that attorney, it's probably a big red flag. Um, Try to mention the word sanctions with that attorney's name. I mean, <laughs> don't every trust attorney, me. Every attorney is going to get sanctioned one time or another, um, but it's a good word to search by. <clears throat> Uh, and every attorney's not going to get sanctioned one time or another. But, yeah. <laughs> um, the other thing is don't trust that just because someone holds themselves out as an expert in something that they are. Um, when we first started handling copyright cases, we ended up going up against a lot of you know, intellectual property firms that really their bread and butter was like patent infringement litigation. And then they kind of just dabbled in some copyright stuff. And, and you know, they just, they, I can think of three firms that we've dealt with that just apply the wrong standards. They just apply like a reasonable like royalty or, or you know, fee. That's your standard in a, in a patent infringement case. It's not your standard in a copyright infringement case. Um, you know, make sure that, uh, that, that they, they really know what they're doing. And if you're looking for someone on a contingency, there really aren't a ton of firms out there handling uh, cases for artists on a contingency basis. And I would say of those that do, they're, you know, are a small handful that, that are actually really good and responsible and know what they're doing. And you I, definitely wanna, I just I want to add to that from the photographer's perspective, when you are talking with the attorney, you want to get a copy of their engagement letter and you want to read it. You know, photographers put more effort into hiring a plumber than they do hiring an attorney. They're going to check the plumber's references, they're going to go online and look at reviews of the plumber, and then they just sign the first engagement letter that comes to them because they think they're blessed to have an attorney interested. Well, you, just as Stephen said, you, you not only want somebody who happens to have passed the bar, but you want them to have been um, to trial in a photography copyright matter, not just any copyright matter, a photography copyright matter. Few cases go to trial, relatively few, but things come up at trial that uh, an attorney who's primary, let's say, a transactional attorney, meaning an attorney who advises on, on business transactions and on drafting of agreements and such, um, might not be prepared for the full-on assault of tri at, at trial and might not have the experience to know um, how to best respond to all the motions that are going to fly. 
Yeah, there, there was a great article some years back in the ABA Law Journal about the uh, the disappearing trial lawyer, about uh, how every year, you know, it just the bar, every state's bar churns out a bunch more lawyers. And you look at the the, the exponential increase, you know, in the number of lawyers every year. Um, you know, there's, there's probably three times more now than there were, you know, in 1970 or whatever it is. And yet fewer and fewer cases end up going to trial. And so that tells you something. It tells you that that the percentage of lawyers out there that actually are, are really trial lawyers, that the take cases to trial is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, you know, my firm, I, I've taken over a dozen copyright cases to trial. We've, uh, we've won every single one of them. We, um, you know, we just, I mean, we love what we do. I'm a trial lawyer. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who have followed what we've done, what my firm has done over the last 15 years, you know, handling a large volume of copyright cases and said, hey, this looks like, because we, we've settled literally thousands of copyright infringement cases and you know, taking a small percentage of those to trial as needed. And people look at what we do and say, hey, th those guys are churning over all these copyright cases. I can get in there and I can just settle a bunch of cases and, and it looks like a good way to make some money. And there've been a lot of copycat firms that have sort of jumped up to, to sort of do what we do. And when push comes to shove and those cases have to go to trial, the clients are not well served and they get in trouble. And I'm not suggesting that there aren't other fine attorneys out there. Um, but a lot of them are, are basically looking for the quick buck and seeing, hey, look at what these guys are doing and, and I can do that without really having put the, the work into making sure you really know the fundamentals. Do you find that, for, do photographers ask you for references before they sign with you or can they? I mean, is that part of the process that a photographer might consider or? Um, I mean, you, you could. I, I, I mean, if you're asking me, the answer is no. Um, we're pretty well known. Uh, people come to us. Uh, no, I, I can't remember the last time I was asked for references. Um, but you know, we also have a, a really amazing list of A-list client, you know, clientele in the photography world. I mean, we've, you know, we've handled litigation cases for you know a lot of really big name photographers. Um, so, if, but if they were going to another attorney, would that be a normal part of like, what would they, so you're saying do research, do the Google search, look up certain things about them. Yeah. Um, are there other things I, that they can do to help figure out getting a right So my, my personal view is that asking for referrals is probably not the best thing in, in the photography world. And the reason why I say that is because there's a lot of photographers it's easy to it's easy to take a case and settle it for five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars. Like it's easy to do that once, twice, three times, ten times. And there are attorneys who, in my view, are not very skilled attorneys who've done that. And to their clients who don't know anything about the law, they're the greatest thing ever. Oh my God, they just got me ten thousand dollars on this use of this photograph. I highly recommend them. You know, it doesn't really tell you that those attorneys are going to do a good job when they really need to. And what I really worry about are the people with bigger claims, right? The people with the claims that, that could be worth a half million dollars and up, and the case ends up settling for $120,000 and the photographer doesn't know any better and is like, oh my God, a six-figure settlement, that's amazing. And I would look at that case and be like, you totally just sold that out. You know, and it's just... It, it, in general, I'm a fan of referrals and like listening to what people have to say. But one of the biggest problems with the legal industry is that you have, it's an information failure. It's, it's that the people who are being serviced by their attorneys can tell in the end if they're satisfied with the result. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they can say that their attorney did the best possible job for them. Um, and, and I, it, it's not, it's not a, I know it's not a very satisfactory answer, but it's just sort of how I think about it. And if somebody comes to you, are you doing a calculation uh, based on how much they usually get for licensing fees, how the image was used? Are you doing a, a price calculation to determine the value of the job before you agree to take it on? Is that how the process would work? Sometimes. I mean, we, we like to help people out. Um, we like to help out photographers. We like to help out artists. Um, we don't, I don't get hung up on whether I'm going to make a killing on every case. And I'll take small cases just, just because it's the right thing to do. And the client was, was wronged. 
Um, I mean, I know that we're going to have some cases that are small cases. We're going to have some cases that are big cases. And, you know, in the end, we, you know, we've brought in about $100 million uh, in, in verdicts and settlements for our copyright holding clients over the past 15 years. Um, you know, it all kind of evens out in the wash. Speak to an attorney. Speak to an attorney if you've got a case that you want to pursue. Um, you know, it, it doesn't have to be the biggest case in the world. It's as long as it's it's right. Uh, I'll tell you one story about sort of the value of the case that really again goes you know brings us back to this registration question. And that's some people um, some people that I know on this call have heard the story before, but it's it's kind of one of my favorites because I get to defense counsel telling me, "You're not going to take this small case to trial," and I'll tell them, "All right, let, let me let me tell you a story." I had a case one time where if I were looking at the actual damages on the case, it was about $1,700. And then that was like, that's kind of what it was. I mean, when you look at like the actual damages, defense counsel calls me up, we've got timely registration. Defense counsel calls me up, says, guy I've worked with before, come on, let's get this case done. What's it gonna take? I'm like, all right, do we need to do the whole dance? Do you wanna, do, do we need to do the Turkish Bazaar? Do you want the no haggle price? He goes, no, just give me your bottom line. Let's get rid of the case. All right, talk to my client, go back to him, $4,500. Let's do it. Ah, you're crazy. I'll give you $1,700. Jed, you said you wanted the no haggle price. $4,500. I can get you $3,000. He goes, I go, how about $4,500? Settlement negotiations broke, negotiations broke down. We went all the way through discovery. We took the case all the way through trial. Because of our client had timely registration, we could seek statutory damages. The jury found non-willful infringement, but still awarded us the statutory maximum of 30000 And when the judge found out they could have settled the case for four to 500 and pushed forward with no real defense to liability, he awarded us all our attorney's fees. It turned into a six-figure judgment. They actually paid it off, and we were able to go to our client. Here's your 30000 in statutory damages the jury gave you. We took the costs and fees. Nice doing business with you. So that's, you know, you can look at the case, you can look at the actual value of the case, but if statutory damages are in play, you never really know. You know, Jeff mentioned that there are very few cases where people have gotten the statutory maximum of 150,000. Um, the last case I took to trial before that H&M case was a case against uh, five infringers, each of whom separately used the work, but it was all kind of related. Uh, the jury found three of them to be willful and actually did award the maximum of $150,000 against each. And then two others, they found innocent infringers and we still got 10 and 20,000. So it's a $480,000 jury verdict where actual damages soaking wet, if I looked at all the licensing fees and profits and everything would have been about $35,000. So that's the beauty of statutory damages is it allows you, it allows us to take a case that might otherwise be small and push it forward to where the defendants are either going to pay something that is gonna you know, be meaningful to our client or we could take the case to trial and have fun with it. And having said all that, I do wanna bring it back to the idea that Jeff was bringing up earlier where there's also ways that if it was a client or if it was somebody who certainly wasn't intending to do harm, that there's ways to negotiate with people um, without going down that route. That that's great when there's, when things have really, your work has been stolen by somebody and used in a, a way that profits somebody. But um, for many of our clients we know, or photographers, we know that it's a, a client who's misused something. So we encourage photographers to certainly try to um, have it work out in a, in a fair and equitable way for everyone. Um, and yep. then if it doesn't, um, certainly, you know, contact APA, we'll put you in touch with somebody, with Stephen or, or one of the other attorneys who we know who, from photographers we know have worked with. Um, so certainly we, we encourage people to have a conversation, be part of a community. It's part of why you join APA, be part of APA, be with other professional photographers who can help help tell you about their personal experiences. We're gonna be doing more of these kind of seminars. There's a lot of conversation about filling out the form, how to do it properly. We will do more in-depth webinars later, um, but I really wanna thank Stephen and Jeff for, 
for giving us an overview today of how to think about this, what the potential is. I mean, you heard from Stephen where things could be taken, but, um, but also just, just to protect yourself and, and work it out ahead of time. Um, so thank you both. Do you, either of you have a closing, Stephen, do you want to? Yeah, let me, let me, I mean, I just want to say that the registration gives you, gives you the hammer, but that said, always be reasonable. And, you know, I can, I can comfortably say that in every case I've taken to trial, I've done better than the demands I've made because we make reasonable demands. And I let everyone know that we're not here to make anyone's life more difficult than possible than it needs to be. We're not here to make a case into a bigger deal than it needs to be. Um, you know, we're going to take a look and see like if someone really seems like it was an instant mistake, we're going to work with them. Um, and even for all of all of you out there who might, might've heard some of, <laughs> some of my stories and be like, Oh my God, I can get, you know, just, we always want to be reasonable. We always want to just, you know, be good people that are there to, to protect rights and, and set things right. And that's it. Thank you. And then yeah. I, I would say, you know, registration, you should treat it like a cost of doing business. Um, you likely pay for liability insurance, perhaps through APA every year, you know, a thousand bucks or whatever, uh, or whatever your policy is, your premium. Um, this is insurance. This is insurance to protect your work and also mm -hmm to give you a revenue stream um, down, you know, down the line when you discover infringements of, of your work. It's well worth it, um, especially, um, you know, just in the, in the course of doing jobs, you can register your work between the time you take it and the time you deliver the work. And some photographers even bill that copyright registration fee to their clients. They put it in their estimates and they bill it to their clients. And when their client says, why are you doing this? You say as a photographer, well, I, I want to be able to shut down anybody who uses this work without our permission, our permission, right? So very, very important to register your work and you just, you need to get used to that cost, even though it's higher now at $55 per 750 images, it's the best purchase you can make. Right. Thank you. Thank you for everybody who joined today. Uh, if you, we want you to join APA, but also you can just sign up for our newsletters to find out when we'll be having more of these. So thank you very much. And um, we'll see you next time on APA Biz Talk. Julia, thank you so much for the opportunity. Same, thank you. Thanks.